So, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, this talk is titled Running a Small to Mid Sized Enterprise on Debian, but because I'm notoriously bad at naming things, I would add the subtitle like Managing Debian Across the Whole Fleet. So, just a couple of words about the presentation. It's the success story kind of thing. It's mostly what we do at my um, day job. So, uh, I'll make a short uh, introduction and then I will try to cover aspects of uh, installing, managing configuration, managing packages, and getting your people involved. So, just a quick introduction. Uh, I'm Apollon, also known as Apicos in Debian. Uh, my day job is the head of infrastructure at Scrooge GR, which is what we'll be uh, seeing in a minute. Uh, I've been a relatively long time Linux user and um, Debian admin since more than 10 years. Um, I started contributing to Debian a while back and I became a DD finally uh, two and a half years ago. So nowadays I do mostly packaging work and most of my packages are server oriented, but I also act as a local DSA contact for um, Debian machines hosted at GNET. So, Debian across the fleet, a success story. Um, the company is called Scrooge. Um, that's a funny spelling, but that's how most Greeks would actually spell Scrooge uh, using the Latin alphabet, so it's pretty intuitive when you're Greek. Um, it's basically a product search and comparison engine or a search engine for products available online. And by many ranking it's, rankings, it's the most visited Greek web page right now. So uh, we average about 600,000 visitors daily and um, five and a half million unique visitors per month. That's almost half the county's population. And the whole company uh, has about 150 employees, uh, all in Greece. Uh, which makes it actually a mid-sized enterprise, let's say. So our infrastructure currently consists of about 85 physical servers, and some of them run around 280 to 300 KVM virtual machines, all managed by Ganetti. And they're all dispersed in three physical locations, uh, co-located in different data centers. Uh, we strive to have a redundant infrastructure and many high availability features. And what's actually the thing with small and mid-sized enterprises is that you can't have huge teams of people doing things. So um, currently there is a team of four system administrators doing operations and uh, infrastructure work and the plus one more doing um, office IT support. So what do we use Debian for? The answer is almost everything that can run it. Um, we run our production servers on it, we run our routers using Debian. Um, the developers, many developers run uh, Debian on their workstations or laptops and we use Debian for the majority of the non-technical staff workstations as well. And this also includes some Raspberry Pis that we have connected to televisions like for dashboard displays and I'm probably forgetting a couple more things but I mean, it's almost everything, basically everything, and as far as I know, we just don't run Debian on our switches yet. So, when it comes to servers, um, we're running a pretty modern full HTTP stack, including HAProxy, Varnish, uh, Nginx, and so on. So our main application is a Rails application running on top of Unicorn. Um, we use, as I, as I said before, we use Ganetti for virtual, virtualization cluster management. Uh, for our KVM virtual machines. And apart from the um, website, which is our main service, we also run a full-scale supporting core infrastructure, including things like DNS, email, LDAP, radios, all kinds of monitoring, so which uh, quickly adds up to a big number of machines. Uh, everything is managed using Puppet, and we use Debian packages for practically everything apart from the web application itself which is deployed using Capistrano. So, when it comes to routers, now this is something I personally don't see very often, but in our case, our core routers are really pairs of redundant 1U servers with a bunch of gigabit interfaces. So, we use a bird routing daemon for BGP and OSPF, BGP with our upstream peers and IBGP internally, 
plus OSPF for our own uh, routing domain. Um, on the client side, we ensure things are running smoothly using Keepa Live D, which does VRRP. So the um, gateway IP addresses in our network are all floating between two machines. Um, these machines also do stateful dual stack firewall on the border of the infrastructure. So it's both IPv4 and IPv6 using Firm, which readily offers this capability of writing dual stack rules. And we also use contract D to replicate the firewall state between the machines. So if the active router actually goes down, then the backup replica uh, can continue serving already established connections without an issue. So the busiest of those machines uh, routes about one gigabit per second of traffic. Um, the network's not very big, but we still have three distinct locations, three data centers, uh, five different uplinks from two up different upstream providers, plus one internet exchange that we're connected to. So um, it's uh, really nice to have your router behave like the rest of your infrastructure and be able to manage it using Puppet and even have your things like your BGP peer data in Hiera. Uh, plus, when it's exactly the same as the machine you're working on, you can get rid of SNMP and do things like monitoring uh, like a human should do. So using actual scripts to pick whatever data you want out of the system. <clears throat> now, um, as I said before, there's also a number of workstations that are using Debian in our company. So uh, we have different uses and we have also both technical and non-technical users. So um, technical users, that is engineers and developers, usually get a laptop with full disk encryption pre-installed with Debian and that's it. They can do their own support uh, from then on. Um, for non-technical users, we mostly use desktop computers and we do manage them using Puppet as well. Uh, they all run GNOME as the desktop environment, but we have um, gone along to adding um, gconf and dconf settings to Puppet so that we can ensure uh, uniformity across all this uh, fleet of desktops. Now, let's go on to bootstrapping. How do we actually start a machine's life cycle in a company? Um, we use Debian installer preceding actually across the fleet. So there are a number of ways we use to get the Debian installer running. Most for servers and workstations, that's mostly PXE booting over the network. Uh, laptops nowadays don't have Ethernet cards, so uh, we boot them over USB. And we also use the Debian installer to install virtual machines, which I'm going to say a bit more about later. So the aim here is to have completely unattended installation for most classes of systems and just bring the systems to a point where they can run Puppet. We don't want to answer the Debian installer's prompts. And we have succeeded so far. I mean, we wrote the first preceding uh, file back in the squeeze era, if I recall correctly, and it has been running smooth ever since. Uh, the only, let's say, bad part is that Partman recipes could be a lot better. I don't know how many of you have ever tried uh, writing a full, full precede um, configuration. It's just probably the hardest point is, get, is to get uh, partitioning right. So, one might ask, why do we use a Debian installer for virtual machines? There are tons of images and, yeah, we... Actually, we were running using uh, full image ourselves before. It's just that full images need to be kept up to date and that's additional work. So, you have point releases, you have security updates. Uh, somebody has to actually go out and update that image so that it's the latest and greatest. It's not fun to get your virtual machine up and running only to discover that it needs another 500 megabytes of updates and another reboot. Uh, another factor is that care must be taken to actually strip sensitive data out of those images. SSH keys, some randomization using UUIDs and so on. So I, I heard a story from um, an ex-colleague about their own infrastructure that at some point they found out that the whole fleet of virtual machines 
simply had the same ECDSA host key everywhere because they had a um, they had a, a script in place to just strip the host keys out of the master image, but it was only RSA and DSA aware. So with uh, Jesse, when we started having ECDSA keys as well, the script did what it should, but it didn't strip the ECDSA key. So for us, using the Debian installer just solves all of the above. So we threw together um, a Ganetti operating system provider that's actually a set of scripts that Ganetti calls to provision a, virtual, a newly installed virtual machine with an operating system, which all it does is that it puts an ephemeral KVM instance running the Debian installer with the preceding configuration, uh, actually with the URL to the preceding configuration. And then it captures and logs all the I output and will abort if a prompt appears because that's supposed to be non-interactive. There is no way in Ganetti that you can interact with the installer um, on operating system installation time. Uh, using a local apt cache and uh, using tricks such as write back caching to speed up things a bit, um, the installation time has come down to approximately two minutes per instance, which is something we are willing to pay. We're not a public cloud, we're just creating a couple of virtual machines a day. And after finishing, everything is fresh, everything is the latest and greatest, and no need for additional reboots. So this is something that um, I also intend to package for Debian. Actually, it is a Debian package already, but I need to strip all site-specific stuff and make sure that it can play without um, expecting the preceding file to be uh, in a globally reachable URL of some sort. So you should be able to feed it with a configuration file and that's it. So once this is done, I, I intend to upload it to Debian as well. Now after everything is installed, we obviously need to continue managing it. Um, like many others, we are using Puppet, which is one of the most um, popular solutions these days, but it could have been Chef or Ansible or name whatever else. Uh, so. A configuration management system nowadays is essential for maintaining anything more than a bunch of machines, but people tend to abuse it. So, for instance, for me, configuration management must augment the package manager and not override or replace it. The fact that you can ship arbitrary files to the systems doesn't mean that you actually should do it. So, what can you do to write Puppet manifests, play nice with Debian? In our case, um, we follow a simple set of rules that seems to make sense with Debian and our modules play well enough. So um, the first one is drop configuration files in configuration directories if possible. So there is no reason to go manage etc at sources list, just drop a file with your own repositories in sources list D since the distribution actually provides a way to do this. The second is, in order to allow local administrators of each machine, which may not always be the ones, as, the ones that control Puppet, um, that we create some exclusively managed snippet directories wherever supported. For instance, our rsyslog setup is uh, like this. We have etc d, which is managed by Debian end users, and then we have etc syslog puppet d, which is exclusively managed by Puppet. Anything going there which Puppet knows nothing about will be removed. The same goes for firewall rules using Firm and a couple of other places. The third guideline is just don't ship whole configuration files. Uh, if the changes needed to Debian defaults are relatively few, you can use things like OGS to modify defaults. This will be this will make dist upgrades actually very easy. And plus, you will be able to have your module functioning, uh, especially during times of transition from one stable release to the next one, even if the configuration file has changed. You don't want to uh, go through a dist upgrade and a three-way merge, only to have Puppet replace it with a previous version again on the next run. So just change only the minimum things that you need to change. And the fourth is um, use the package provided facilities like the package divert or stat override to play nice with the package. Just don't enforce permissions and content on operating system managed files. 
divert them or use that override to set the permissions. On the Debian side, what I find, uh, what I call puppet-friendly packaging are packages which just, basically, they, they provide configuration in a way that is easy to manage using Puppet. Uh, what it all comes, out, comes down to is using include configuration from uh, directories by default, and if possible, splitting out the same defaults from sample values. You want Debian-specific defaults to be left untouched, which leads to easier and safer upgrades, uh, while giving the admin or user the ability to override only sample values in a different file. So after having managed, uh, I'd say, yeah, a lot of systems uh, using Puppet and Debian, uh, and I've been thinking of whether a Debian Puppet module would actually be of some use. So the standard Puppet types just manage users and files and execute commands, and yeah, they also manage services and a couple other things, but that's pretty much it. Um, it's in, enough to do almost anything, but still you do need to write, to write boilerplate code in some cases. For example, when you ship or modify a systemd unit these days, you must trigger a systemctl daemon reload. This is something that almost everybody wishing to ship systemd units on a Debian system, or any other system for that matter, should do. Um, and also, we don't make much use of Debian's tools like Depackage Divert or Start Override. So, at least uh, in the concept of, in the um, scope of the Package Puppet, uh, Puppet group, uh, we could provide a batteries included Debian Puppet module that would make the life of Debian sysadmins easier and expose things like um, app sources management or multi arc architectures or um, alternatives or Depackage Divert, and this list can go on for a long way. So this is open to further discussion, and um, I intend to um, at least start a discussion, propose creating such a module at some point. The other thing with configuration management is the question whether we have two or three roles in the end. So both the file system hierarchy standard and the conf file handling right now basically assume two roles. One is the role of the distribution and the, the other one is the role of the local system administrator. So the question is, should we assume that there is also a third one, which is the config management system or let's say site-wide defaults? So in a sense that the configuration management system should be able to override the distribution, but then you still get the local local admin of the machine who should be able to override the CMS. So currently we have USR local, but I mean, where should we drop files using Puppet, under USR or USR local? Where should we place systemd units using Puppet, under ETC on, or under slash lib or a third location? So that's also open to debate, I think. Now, oh, moving on from managing configuration to managing packages. Um, as I said, we're using mostly, that's probably more than 99%, Debian packages from Debian stable as they are, and a few from backports. And for the rest, 1%, it's either not in Debian, it's too old in Debian, or it is site-specific and not worth including in Debian. For the 99%, we use a squid deb proxy as a cache so that we don't hammer the um, local mirrors. And for the 1%, we have a local repository using reprepro. Of course, we try to minimize the delta by contributing wherever possible, uh, but still there's always a set of packages that we have to maintain outside Debian. So unlike the Debian archive, we need multiple versions of the same package for each distribution. Some examples include mostly clustered services or databases where you want to run one version on one cluster and another version on another cluster for some reason. So there you go, MongoDB, Elasticsearch. I'm sure there are a couple of them more, but I'm forgetting right now. And another difference is that we also need some thin partial distributions for certain needs. For example, we are rebuilding Ruby and libcurl against OpenSSL 102, 
because of 101 has broken alternate path checking and it turns out there are some uh, SSL, some cross-signed root CAs out there uh, that break with break break the chains when tried to verify it with uh, 101. And the other case is for Nginx and Haproxy running on our uh, front-end servers where they have to be rebuilt against 102 to get ALPN support for HTTP2. So uh, we don't want to rebuild every, uh, everything against OpenSSL 102. We don't want to ship OpenSSL 102 to every system. So we have to create small partial distributions only for the uh, nodes affected. We do this by doing heavy use of components. So we don't actually create distributions. We have only two distributions and we create comp profile components mostly, uh, which are then tied to specific puppet classes. And we also use some app references magic to uh, boost the preference of the profile components related to the rest. So when deploying a new package to production, um, it's not like the usual Debian upload to unstable thing. It's more like stable release management. So uh, you don't want to deploy a new package or an updated package to the whole fleet. You want to do that gradually and in a controlled way. So we use two main distributions. We have Jesse Scrooge and Jesse Scrooge proposed updates, uh, inspired by stable proposed updates, of course. So both distributions are configured on all machines. Uh, they have um, different app priorities. That's 940 for Jesse Scrooge, which is always preferred versus minus one for um, the proposed updates. So proposed updates must be uh, installed from auto, uh, manually, explicitly. And we also boost the profile uh, packages by another 10 points over main. So all our packages enter the proposed updates and then we do test them, deploy them to certain systems by hand. And after the um, quarantine period is over, we just copy them using repair for copy um, to the stable distribution. When it comes to building now these packages, um, the thing is that they're too small and too few packages and only one architecture, it doesn't really warrant setting up a build D infrastructure. So what we do is we run the builder on our workstations. And in order to get things right and make builds as cons consistent as possible, uh, we have created our own um, wrappers around pbuilder. Uh, we actually use a couple of scripts to manage the truths to create and keep them up to date and also ship some custom configuration and hooks that ensure that things built for a profile component will actually use the correct build dependencies. When you build uh, Ruby against libssl 102, you want it to actually pick that dependency. So we, then we have a wrapper around pdbuild, which builds packages and enforces a correct distribution, which is always proposed updates, and also captures the component from, for which the package was built in an additional field in the changes file. We can then pick it up uh, with a wrapper around repair process incoming and place it in the um, correct component of the repository. So, Deploying security updates. Security updates are hard, actually. Uh, keeping more than 300 machines up to date is difficult. For workstations, there is the lovely unattended upgrades. It solves every problem because workstations are rebooted once a day and we don't really care. They don't run any services. It's perfectly fine. But servers are a different story. Uh, first of all, we want gradual rollout. We don't want a regression to just kill all our machines instantly. And we also don't want any unwanted service restarts, so we can't rely on automatic installations. Uh, currently, we have a custom solution based on Puppet, Servermon, and Redis. Servermon is uh, actually a piece of free software that was written in my previous workplace. It's a dashboard that um, displays information Puppet knows about the host, the host it manages. So uh, part of that is that after every Puppet run, all available updates, uh, all, all sort of package updates that are available on a given machine are posted back to Servermon. So there's a central database that knows which packages need an upgrade on which machine and vice versa. 
So this is all displayed on central dashboard with a handy nice padlock next to security updates. And then what we actually do is that we have a system to manually approve these updates. We call this staging. So we have a CLI tool which can filter on packages by name. It supports globbing. It can filter by hosts also and by whether it's a security update or not. And what it actually does is that it just places a key in Redis and says this host should get this, this, this and that package update. So on the next puppet run, every staged update turns into an apt get installed dash dash no remove dash dash keep old config blah 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 uh, for every package. And so this happens, I mean, Puppet runs every 20 minutes in our infrastructure. So this means that if you globally whitelist um, an update for the whole infrastructure, it will be gradually <coughs> rolled out during the next 20 minutes. And uh, once a package has been installed, then Puppet reports back to the Puppet master and we have a report processor there that deletes successfully installed updates from Redis. So they won't be retried or notifies us if app get install exited with a non-zero value for any reason. So this system has um, worked well enough. Um, it, we still don't handle um, replaced libraries. We do this by hand, although now with systemd it's really easy to find out whether a given process ID belongs to a service. Uh, you don't need any heuristics to find if it's controlled by an init script anymore. So this is something we will be working on uh, in the future. And I will also try to see if it makes sense and if I can strip all the site-specific thing out of this and make um, some kind of standalone cluster security update manager, let's say, for Debian machines. But it's still in early stages. I mean, it works for us at 300 machines. Most of the time, I would like to have the ability to automatically whitelist certain updates, uh, but it's still a work in progress. So for the last part, people. You want, essentially, to get your sysadmins involved. Why? Because it's benefit both ways. It's for them, it's for the company, and it's for Debian as well. The truth is there's still a relatively high barrier when it comes to um, contributing even for experienced sysadmins. Uh, most people are reluctant to report bugs. So another thing is that build environments are still non-trivial to set up and most people will just use the build when they first want to rebuild the package with uh, not the best results. And, of course, you can't rely on every sysadmin reading the Debian policy on the new, or the new maintainer's guide, especially when they are under uh, work pressure. So, the question is, what can we do to lower that barrier? I mean, as a lead or as a senior sysadmin, you should just lead by example. You file bug reports, but you file them yourself, but at least you keep your sysadmins in the loop so that see, they see what's going on. And you explain why you opted for that severity or why you used a specific tag or what policy issue this was about. And get them to install things like, how can I help? Well, these are all trivial steps, but they tend to help to get people on the right track. Things that we could do in Debian. I think most of the complaints I actually hear about are BTS related. Um, the usual complaint is that the interface is uh, ugly, is inconvenient, blah, blah, blah. Personally, I find it pretty convenient that I like the email interface, but I can understand that many people are put off by it. So I think we should give some effort to get things on that front improved a bit, at least in the search and the interface department. And then you're still relying on report bug by default having a working MTA on the system. And when you're a sysadmin, you will run report bug on the affected server, which might be behind three lines of firewalls and even on a, I don't know, an air gap network. So this really doesn't work. Uh, we, we have to find a way to make things easier in that front. 
adding an M MTA less mode. So I don't know, be that uh, SMTPing directly to Debian org servers might work or creating an alternate transport for bug reports might also work. Um, these are just a couple of ideas. I'm, I mean, it's just something that we at some point should discuss. So I'm sure there's a lot we can do here. These are just a couple of suggestions. So I'd be glad if anybody has any more or anybody would like to discuss after this presentation. So a couple of links. This is server Mona I was talking about. And the other one is a um, link to Vincent Bernard's uh, post about local corporate app repositories, which was the basis on, um, for the design of our own repositories. So I guess we're a bit early. Yes, there's time for a couple of questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? What's your solution to avoid restart uh, on package updates? To? Uh, avoid restart, uh, service restart on package updates. Okay. So um, we don't have a single solution for that. Um, what we basically do is that we do the updates to affected packages manually, completely manually, as in SSH to the machine and install the package at a convenient time. Um, this thing is getting a lot more difficult when you're dealing with clustered services. For example, when you have Elasticsearch, you don't want even, even if it was acceptable to restart Elasticsearch on a single node, there are constraints between different nodes. So you can't go and restart two nodes on the cluster if you have only two replicas of each shard, because at some point you will have one shard that will be completely lost. Um, so our solution for the time being is uh, do this manually and um, we do have some policy RCD harness in place but not for upgrades for different kind of uses um, but clustered services are really a problem in that respect I mean even if you solve it um, at the machine level uh, you then have to solve it at cluster level so something like a hook in the packages transaction at the point where it should run the pre-inst or the post-inst script would make things a lot easier. So if you could actually have a policy layer that will say if a restart is acceptable or not at this point um, would make things a lot easier. Other questions? No questions? It's not really a question, but mm -hmm. well, I wanted to point out that uh, report bug already supports sending mail directly to a Debian.org server okay. on the submission port. And it okay. offers this in the configuration at the end. Mm -hmm. But it's not used by default, right? It's not, well, report bug uh, has no say in default configuration. Mm -hmm. When you start it the first time, it, it asks you a lot yes. of silly questions. Yeah. And maybe it should be the default with that. Yeah, I know. I mean, I mean, I first ran report bug a long time ago and yeah, I have the same configuration ever since, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Other question? No questions? Thank you very much. There's one more question. Yeah. That was the last minute question. Um, in your old Debian workstation environment, what do you use for internal communication? Just IRC or things like that? Do you have something entirely free software that works across your organization? Well, we used to have IRC and then we had a Jabber server as well. Uh, currently, we're using Slack because uh, that's more convenient for non technical users. So, and there are also people with some people with Macs and some very few people with Windows workstations, so that it was becoming too diverse and people were not accustomed to IRC but we were using IRC for a long time. So you just got the IRC but with GIFs now? Yes. Uh, 
Are you paying any attention to unfixed security issues and how they might affect you? Two, I'm sorry? Security issues that haven't been fixed yet. That haven't been fixed yet, so... There's a, like a JSON feed from security track at Debian yeah, that you I can know. look at. At some point I started uh, writing um, an integration, a bridge between the security tracker and Servermon so that you could have a list of which CVEs affect which machine. Um, it didn't get far. I mean, got to a point where I got everything to a database and I could use it on my own. Then I had to do some real work. So <laughs> like every weekend project just fell behind, but it's something that I really like to do. I mean, honestly, we've solved things at the machine level pretty well with Debian. Now everything is expanding so fast that I think we have to provide tools to uh, at least provide some deep insight into big clusters running Debian. And getting things integrated with Security Tracker or UDD um, is really, I mean, for me it's a way forward. But this also needs work on the Debian side. I mean, um, right now Security Tracker just exports a huge JSON uh, which is generated every time. There's no easy way, as far as I know, to um, query things like incrementally. So, um, but I think it's uh, something worth um, investigating. So, yeah, we do check when we know that something is actually important. We do check the security tracker, but it's not a part of the day-to-day -day workflow right now. So the day-to-day -day workflow is just updates that are already in um, uh, security. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.